Hello YouTube land, this is Bretton Son coming to you from Lexington, Kentucky, the Bluegrass State. Today we have Wade and Sheila who are coming to share a story about when they owned a bar and they started messing with a Ouija board, um, thought that it was going to be some innocent fun. Um, because they were basically at this bar all the time, seven days a week. Um, they had no life outside this place. Uh, they just, you know, started messing with this uh, after hours uh, for some kind of recreation, and um, they got drawn into it. The things turned bad, and um, this is basically a story of what can happen when you do this. Now, at the end of this video, I have a um, little thing showing you um, some scriptures about, or basically Deuteronomy 18.10, and I go over this Deuteronomy 18.10, and then I talk about how if you get yourself into this bind, what you can do to get yourself out of this bind, um, and... Uh, basically what to do, where to go, and uh, how that that would um, work, and uh, that's, you know, if you get yourself into this, and plus to also uh, bring uh, some of the arguments to a close that this, uh, some types of these activities are, you know, no big deal. Um, the scripture basically is very clear about uh, this kind of thing and other things that are even similar so I hope that you uh, enjoy this episode this is uh, got a little bit of uh, adult uh, content so to speak because of where the the uh, this activity was going on so um, you know listen to the whole thing and um, you know uh, just keep the comments nice, I, I, and I mean that, you know, do not say uh, horrible negative things. These people came forward to share this, and uh, they don't do it anymore. They don't mess with the Ouija board. They don't own this bar anymore, and they, this was during the 90s, and, and they, uh, learned, they learned a lesson about what they were doing, for sure, and it was a heavy price, um, you know, at the time, and anyway, hope you enjoy um, if anyone out there has a story they would like to share, contact me at brentson at gmail.com. Uh, give me a description of your story and contact information. I'll get back to you. Um, between now and the end of this month coming up, um, um, this is the last day of July. So next month through uh, um, the, the whole month, I am uh, asking uh, for people to uh, uh, give contributions to this channel I'll uh, leave a link to PayPal me you can click one time it's a very easy process you don't have to go through a bunch of uh, you know clicking this and getting information typing in all that kind of stuff it's a very simple one-step process to make a uh, donation to the channel to, to help me through this uh, summertime slump uh, and thank you to all those who have uh, made a contribution and uh, every time that I see that someone has uh, made a donation, I certainly uh, am very thankful. And I stop right then and make sure that I thank God and I say a prayer for each and every person who has made a contribution. So let's go to our guest. I hope you enjoy and make sure that you check out the teaching at the very end on Deuteronomy 18.10. All right, YouTube land. This is a story I've been promising you that would be coming um, toward the end of the month. And Wade came on and shared uh, some uh, stories, a uh, dog man and a monster that he saw when he was a little kid and uh, some different things. And and uh, in, during that interview, uh, we mentioned that we were going to be bringing a story about when he owned a bar. Well, he, he and uh, his uh, wife are, uh, are here to share this story, and um, this is going to be very interesting, and I just want to say before we, we start, this is going to be a lesson of what can happen when you do these type of things that we're going to be talking about, 
and they no longer are involved in any activities like Ouija board and things like that so um, anyone who wants to leave a comment make sure that it isn't mean and nasty because I promise you that I will delete it out and also before we get started this is going to have adult content somewhat in it because of the uh, places in which these things happened but I think that it's best not to uh, hinder the story that we tell it exactly uh, how the story was with the you know the details as much as we can without going overboard with it uh, so that you understand the whole idea and concept of what um, what we're going to try to get out of this whole thing so without further ado let's just go to Wade and Sheila and uh, I'll let them introduce themselves briefly and what state and what have you they're from. Hello, Wade. Hello, Sheila. How you doing? Hello, I'm Sheila. I'm from Texas, the eastern part of Texas. And I am Wade. I'm doing great, man. Good to talk to you. Well, I, I appreciate you coming to uh, talk about this. I, I thought that, man, your story could make a movie. Um, <laughs> you know, if you was to put it together right, you could make a movie out of this, and it would probably be a blockbuster. Um, and uh, the movie. if you got the right producer, it would be a scary movie too. That's for sure. Um, if we had the person put it together for us, you're right, sir. Yeah, yeah, and and I think there's a there, there's a good chance of you know helping someone uh, take this uh, serious. Uh, you know what they shouldn't be doing. You know some some types of activities. Some people try to make arguments for all. Oh, it's just having fun and things like that, but you know for certain that it, it, it isn't just fun. Um, it could be fun at first or something, but it can turn very ugly. It seems, it seems to be fun. At first. In fact, that's how, that's, that's how it started. We started it just to have, just to have fun, just to have something to do. And right. it seemed to be fun at first. Right. And so, it, it so, was fun. So let, let's go back to uh, set us up for back in the day when you, uh, what business you had and uh, kind of what we talked about before we came on, um, the okay. kind of life that you had running this bar and what kind of bar it was and things like that. And okay. Wait. All right. Well, this is, uh, mind you, this is back in the 90s and we have not touched a Ouija board since. Um uh, Anyways, back in the early 90s, in 91 or 92, uh, we were running a club. Uh, it was a gentleman's club, which, if you don't know what that is, that means it's a topless club. Uh, and we might, ha and it's very, you know, I've had a lot of people over the years say, what a great thing that must, you know, I love job and this and that, you know. Uh, but the problem is that they don't realize what all it encompasses. You, for example, you have 50, you know, 50, 60 different girls on a schedule. You got 20, 25 of them a night working. You've got a DJ. You've got a couple bartenders. You've got, you know, Waitress. three, four, yeah. six waitresses. You've got 150 customers. And it literally can drive you insane in just a few minutes when it's only the two of you to to control everything, you know. And uh, in order to run a club, you know, you're there. We were there seven days a week. I average 18 hours a day uh, from the moment we unlocked the front door to the moment we locked it. And, uh, you know, we had to get there at 8 in the morning, and people say, well, why do you have to get there so early? You know, well, because you have vendors to take care of, uh, normal business things, running to the bank and stuff. So, you know, just just the club was our entire life, the inside of those four walls. And again, seven days a week, 18 hours a day for years. If we ever had any time off, it was never all at once. It, it might be a, a day off, you know, every six months or something like that, or more likely a half a day off. So it got to where we would... Uh, create our, you know, everybody needs entertainment. So we would create our own entertainment after hours, you know. Yeah, at the club. Yeah, we would, we, when we shut those doors, 
it was like you're still keyed up from running the business. So what do you do? So we would do things after hours. Uh, for example, one time I bought some go karts from there's a go kart track up the road. When we shut down the club, we would uh, open up the doors and run the go karts through the club, out on the parking lot, hose down the lot, slide them everywhere, you know, things like that. Um, Play we, we got into a paintball kick where we would. Uh, just open up the doors after hours and run around inside, outside the building, shooting paintballs at each other. Um, that became uh, quite an activity for us for, for a long time. So just kind of wanted to set the stage for the, for the story. Uh, the Ouija stuff started because it wasn't, we needed entertainment, something it, to do. What he's saying is it wasn't that we... It wasn't that we were witchcraft hunters and went out to do the Ouija board as something of that nature. We went out to just find something to do. Right. Which, in some cases, is, is how it yeah. starts. It well, was, everybody, when you're a kid, works the Ouija board. That's, that's kind of what that's your little passage when you grow up, you know. And we hadn't really done it since we were kids. But uh, she she came up with a board. Uh, yeah. Didn't you buy one yeah. or something like that? We decided, hey, let's do that. We haven't done it in a long time. So I ran to Hastings one night and bought a board and bought it back. And we sat on the center stage and worked the Ouija board. And this was and after hours, though, correct? This was after hours. Mm -hmm. And that... You know, what we would do is we would, uh, you know, we, we'd shut down the club, we'd end our night, uh, run all the customers out and count down the banks for the bartenders and things, and, and pretty much just everything that needed to be done was, was shut down. And then we'd go around, and, and it, it, it was a big club, so we'd shut down all the lights throughout the club, which took 10, 15 minutes, and, and we'd get on the main stage, uh, where we worked the board, and there were black lights above the main stage, and we would kick those on, I guess, for added ambiance or whatever. And that, that's kind of how we would do it, but definitely after hours. Yes, sir. So all the customers got everything about the club taken care of that had to be taken care of, business done, and then that was our time to just have fun, just the same as it was when we played the paintball or did. It was just to have, that's how it started, was just something to do. Right now, and, now when 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 you when you thought of this idea, and I, and I know that there's a lot of people that that um, you know have thought to maybe do that, kind of innocently, not understanding um, that that it can be that dangerous. At first, when you had the idea, was you kind of thinking? Did you have any reluctance saying maybe we shouldn't do this, th you know, t type of thing? Or would you thinking it, yeah, there's no big deal kind of thing? Actually, there, I didn't, I didn't have any, it was, I didn't approach it as dangerous, as dangerous at all. It was no, I literally approached it as, as a game, as a Ouija board, just, Kind of just as I a game. It as a game is, yeah, when, because I'd never worked one as a, as a kid. I'd never, I had never worked a Ouija board before. Right. And right. I'd always heard people push the planchet. That's how it works. I, I, you know, I never, I, I, I'd never experienced yeah. a Ouija board. Yeah. I mean, you, um, you know, back when I was young, just to be honest with you, I, I thought, eh, there's probably nothing to that. Uh, you know what I mean? Because I heard a few people say something. I just didn't understand those type of things. So I thought when people would tell you the thing moved by itself, I just thought they were fibbing about it, you know. But I would never really wanted to mess with it because of an encounter I had when I was five. With You know, so I, I, I kind of never wanted to chance it, you know what I mean? <laughs> But, but, right. so I'm not judging at all. Don't, don't think I'm judging. I, I just kind of wondered if you had any kind of reluctance, uh, like if you'd ever heard anything or, you know, something like that. Um, and it, you were kind of a little well, bit reluctant. I myself had no reluctance. I had worked the board 
I'd worked Ouija board off and on throughout my teenage years. Uh, never had any great cool stories to tell. Uh, yeah. Kind of the last time I worked it, you know, when I would work with my friends, I'd always want to prove that it would work, you know. So uh, uh, I, I got some some initials and date of birth, date of death, what cemetery the spirit we were talking to were in, and, and we literally we went out that night and we found the grave where this guy was. You know, I just thought that was the greatest thing in the world. So, and that was about the last time I worked it up until... The, the club days and uh, so I myself had no reluctance and you know back then the internet was in its infancy so all these uh, the horror stories that you might hear about a Ouija board they weren't available to us right it yeah. was just word of mouth here and there and and, and now, nowadays you know you know that man don't mess with this stuff it's what the majority of things seem to teach and say but, but back in the early 90s, uh, there was nothing out there to teach you that, for the most part. Right, yeah. Well, I, I yeah. Believe me, I understand. That, you know, it was, uh, there wasn't a whole lot of stories out there other than just what you heard from, you know, different people if that subject ever came up. So let, let's uh, get into then um, when you first started doing this and kind of take us up through the the uh, escalating uh, of of it, and uh, just just do the All best right. you can on on you know timeline and what have you. Well, you know it, it was so many. So we're we're going to mess up a little bit, so things will kind of come at you random here. Um, I can tell you kind of how it first started and and yes, and what really amped us into wow, this is neat, you know, and then. Uh, I'll let Sheila tell you kind of the first little story that, that grabbed us. But anyways, we would, uh, we, we, we get everybody out of the building, we'd set the board on the stage and we'd start. And a lot of it was her and myself that would work it. Uh, but more often than not, we always had under two that would, uh, that worked at the club with us would stay and work, work, uh, if it wasn't myself and, and Sheila, it would be her and uh, another female. And the we we quickly latched on to a couple of I'll, I'll call them spirits for lack of a better case. We quickly latched on to two different ones. Uh, they went by the name of U, and he spelled it H U. And the other was a female spirit named Eliza. And it kind of drew us in, and and I began to notice early on that in all my work in the Ouija board experiences when I was younger, you know, you ask questions, and then you get yes or no answers for the most part. You know, and every once in a while, I would step out there and do something a little bit cooler, but that was it. Well, we noticed that kind of right off the bat, the Ouija board was asking us questions. Um and it was just doing stuff that was I've never seen a board do before. For example, let's say Sheila and another girl, they would work the board. Their hand would be on the planchette. Uh, I'm sitting at the stage watching everything with my friend. And the planchette, now mind you, their hands would never leave the planchette. It's not like it would take off on its own, not meaning to imply that. But the planchette would literally uh, ask a question like, how are you feeling? And we we just openly say we're we're fine, everything's cool, it's good. And then with their hands on the planchette, it would leave the board and would literally take off around the stage some, and they would kind of roll and follow it, you know. And there was one one instance in particular that you know the Ouija board had a sense of humor. It uh, the planchette was moving around the stage. Uh, and then it went up to Sheila's foot. She was barefoot at the time. And it started bumping her foot. Uh, and and what is, kind of par chair. pardon, I don't mean to be kind of ignorant about it, but what is, you said a planned what now? A plant shed? A plant shed. I'm calling it a plant, the plant shed. That's, uh, that's the device that everybody places their fingers on. The so, little plastic piece that's in the, the Ouija board. And it's called a what? Planchette. With a P L A N 
C H E T T E. Okay. It's also got a device in it. It's a little window in it that my. It sometimes that that window will center up over the letter, and then sometimes the tip of the planchette, which is pointed, will, okay. will be directly over a letter. Okay, just just in case people didn't know that that's that's what okay. that is. Okay, Makes sense. and and it would take off around the stage. It would take off around the stage. Uh, it would literally sometimes come right up in front of me sitting in a chair at the stage. Then it would center up and point directly at the person next to me. And this incident in particular I'm talking about, it it, it scooted right up to her, her bare foot. And it, it bumped her foot three, maybe four times, the tip of it. And then it went back to the board and it spelled out tickle. And when it spelled out tickle, I just sat back. I could not believe that it had done that. It interacted with us with a sense of humor. And I was already somewhat astonished because it was asking us questions. And again, I've never had a Ouija board do this. Yeah, but, but and, uh, I, I, here's what I'm kind of stuck on. Is this thing went by itself around the stage and then comes up to your foot and taps you? It was still, our were still on the... Yeah, their fingers would never leave it. On the planchette. It, oh, so most it, it of the was time when you're working, the board. Okay. Oh, it, I, it, it, would leave, it would leave the actual board itself. It would leave the Ouija board itself. Our, our fingers would still be, like it, when you're working a Ouija board and your fingers are on the, board, on the planchette itself, the planchette is what your fingers are on as you're working. It's going around the board, spelling out letters. All right. The planchette would actually leave the board itself and move across the floor. The stage. The okay, so you are sitting on the ground then. We're sitting. We're si uh, we'll, we'll call it the floor. Okay, that, that's, I was stage. wondering how it was touching your foot. I, was, I thought it went off the table and went around its, the whole stage by oh, itself. No, that, and that's, that's where we messed up, right? So, okay, so we're the sitting board, on the floor. It's laying on the floor of the stage. Okay, all right. But let's just call it the floor, okay? Okay. So we're on the floor, and it, it would leave and go across the floor, and it, would, it bumped my foot, and then went back across the floor and spelled out tickle. Right. So it was implying that it was tickling my foot. Right. Okay. So I guess, uh, I, you know, we may not have set it up quite Properly, I guess if you thought we were working it on the table or whatever, that that wouldn't make sense. But yeah, it, it was it was laying on the floor of the stage, and and the girls were like just sitting on the stage themselves. Okay, you know, right. I got you. <laughs> Sorry. There you go. That makes a lot more sense. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. So you know, I was just saying that's one example of of when I realized that this was more than just working a normal Ouija board. It not only was it talking to us and asking us questions, it had a sense of humor, you know. I've never encountered that, never heard of that. And that kind of, that's what started drawing us into it. It made it more, we, you know, and we would work it for 30 minutes or an hour or two hours, uh, go home, get a couple hours sleep, come back to the club, and we couldn't wait for the club to close to do it again, you know. Right. So did you, it, did you kind of feel like maybe that, this was um, drawing you in um, by strategy? Well, maybe later yeah. that I, I kind of realized, Sheila didn't really realize it because she was the one that, that it was after. Uh, when all this was happening, you know, this lasted for a period of nearly three months. Uh, the, the early stages of it, we didn't know anything about drawing in. We were so naive to the fact of, of different things and what was going on. We just thought that we had a couple cool friends that we were talking to that were spirits, and we didn't know about it drawing us in. Later, I discovered what was going on, you know, and it definitely was working us and drawing us in. We just didn't know it at the time. Right. Okay. As far as the, as far as the innocent part of it, when 
it's so easily to be drawn in. If, if, if anybody ever thinks of picking up a Ouija board and working it, it's so easy to be drawn in because I never even considered that this was an evil entity that I might be talking to because it felt like yeah. we were simply talking. It, it felt like this was a, we had just gotten into the spirit world and we're talking to right. really interesting entities and, and how interesting this was. It was, it was, yeah, yeah, and that, that was that's something I, I was going to get into um, a little bit later on the fact that the the scriptures call these things deceiving spirits, and I think people fail to realize the different tactics that they might try to employ to draw a person in to give heed to them. The, the, the scripture talks about giving heed to these seducing spirits. They seduce. They 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 are seducing you with humor. They were seduced, and and you know whenever they can tell you the a uh, grave and a uh, and the date on a grave and things like that, it's because they know it. They know that those that information. They are real entities, and and uh, so they yes. therefore they they know lots of different things. They could tell you, and it, some people would get amazed. It's like oh, they knew Aunt, Aunt whatever's uh, um, name and the day she died or something like that. Those spirits have access to phenomenal amounts of information that they can employ to seduce and um, so that that's something we'll get into later um, I, I think that we should just kind of keep this progression on how seducing and the the long con they were playing to gain your trust before they turned on you right there's a there's a, you know, I told you there were there were different incidents that occurred that are, are worthy of mention. One of them that occurred very early on, and it, it possibly could have been kind of the first first thing that uh, was a shocker. And I'm gonna let Sheila tell you the story about it. Okay. But basically, it was uh, the spirit of somebody she knew when she was younger that had passed on. So I'll just kind of turn it over to her. And like I say, this started very early on in us working the Ouija. And it's one of those things that drew us back to it night after night. So go ahead and tell your story. <laughs> um, when I was very, very young, I had a, a very good friend of mine who was in a car accident and was killed by a deer that they hit. The deer flew in the window and, and, and killed him. And as we were working the Ouija board, the this I'm not I'm not gonna say it was his spirit because it I don't I don't know that but to talk about starting a fire or something with you when the, you were kids. The <laughs> whoever we were speaking to knew so many, so many details. Right. about my friend and everything that we did when we were were kids and he and, and knew about the accident and knew everything about that and, and we talked to him for we talked to him for quite some time you started crying um, it, it was it, it was just like being back with that childhood friend yeah um, and the that was just one of the incidences, but the, it was mostly the, the, the things that we did with Hugh, which was the good entity we were talking to, were just fun. We talked about our auras. Um, he told everybody in the room their, their aura and, and how fun that was and what our auras meant and, Wade's aura, of course, was red. Red. I got the red one because he was angry all the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my job. You, you. Angry all the time too. Um, she was aura was iridescent. My aura was iridescent, and that was why he told me that was why um, it was so attracted. I was so attractive to 
later on, the, the, the thing away? that wanted to get her, that's why she was, because uh, it loved her iridescent aura. But I want to go back for a second and, and say the friend that passed in the car wreck, I remember, you know, as we're talking about it, we're remembering more as we go on. I remember when you were working the Ouija and it was to, it seems like to me you said something like, well, how do we know it's you, you know? How do we know that it's you we're talking to? And it brought up the fact that you two have set, as bad as it sounds now, set some sort of little fire somewhere, and you, you were both involved in it. Not that they burned down a house and were arsonists, but it was something about a fire. And I remember you sitting back and going, oh, my God, that's right. Mm -hmm. And and that was the, the kicker that made her really feel like that she was talking to that Ooh, person. A real person. Because it knew that incident. Wow. Knew something from my past that couldn't have been known. And, and, and then back on the aura thing, the auras became a really big deal throughout the rest of the the story. I mean, it, it just kept popping up time and time again. And, you know, I, if there's anything to do with auras in the field of Ouija boards or, or whatever, you know, I don't know what it is, but it sure seemed important at the time, you know. Yeah. Well, it's kind of a new new age type concept. So these, these entities are going to know a lot about that type of thing. And, and another thing I just want to touch on, on a point with, this thing knowing so much about you and your friend and what have you, the scriptures would call cause these things familiar spirits because just like you, God, God assigns an angel to watch over you. Uh, the, Jesus talked about this one time. He said when he put a little child on his lap, he said, "Do you not know that their angel beholds the face of the Father continually?" So, so God gives you an, a good angel to basically watch over you throughout your life. And also, the, if you look in the story with Job, there's also entities that are negative who follow you around. And they're familiar with you. They're familiar with your life. They know lots of things. And these things are thousands of years old. They may have followed your relatives. So they're familiar spirits okay. with you and your families. So that's a lot of times how psychics and, and fortune tellers and things like that will draw people in because the familiar spirit that will speak to them knows so much about their lives. And when God asked Job uh, or asked uh, uh, Satan, which means adversary. So I don't know if this was actually Lucifer or what, you know, he was an adversary to Job for sure. But he said, right. have you considered my servant Job? And he said, yes, I have, but you have a hedge set up. He was protected by uh, by God. He said, you have a hedge set up. And, he, and he, he went to describe this hedge. This is how many things this entity was knowing about Job. He said, you had this hedge set up around his home. You had this hedge set up around his family. You had this hedge set up around all that he has. And it was a multi-layered hedge. So, in a way, when you look at this, you could see how many different things these entities were looking at in these, this person's life, in his family, in all that he had. They would have been familiar with every aspect of his life, trying to look for a door or an opening in. And I think with Job, it ended up being fear, because he was getting up making sacrifices for his children for fear of what was going to happen. And, uh, and people of faith are not supposed to live in fear. And I believe that was the, the door uh, that, that was open in Job's life for this permission to be given. And plus for a future lesson for us to look at this case in the, in the scriptures. But familiar spirits, they know everything about, you know, not, not, maybe not every single thing, but they know a lot about a person's life in little details. Okay. And, the, and that can be very alluring. Um. Well, I, I just want to say that for the learning. people's sake listening. So so the people listening can understand how something like that can happen and it not be your friend. Because if it was your friend, he would have warned you. Quit doing this. Oh, good point. Then that actually explains, because when, when working the Ouija board also, he... He would actually know things that were happening at that time as as well. Um, for example, one night in working the Ouija board, we had also 
played paintball before we worked the Ouija board that night. And one of the people that were standing, standing beside us at the stage as we were working the Ouija board had red paintball, paintball paint on his T-shirt. I shot him several times. <laughs> he had paintball paint shirts. And Hugh um, asked what what's, what happened. I don't remember how he asked it. What happened to Ricky? Or R- Ricky came. They were working the Ouija board on the stage. And like we had discussed earlier, you know, right there, they're sitting down on the stage working it. I was sitting at the stage, and my friend Ricky, who I had creamed in paintball, shot him many times in the chest with red paintballs. He sat down, and the girls were working the board. So once again, the planchette leaves the board, and you know, and their hands are always their hands never left it, but it would leave the board, and it went over right in front of Ricky, and it just sat there for a minute, right in front of his white T-shirt cover. In one of them, back to the the Ouija board and said it asked us what was wrong, what the color was. And I go, and I was astonished, but I, I said out loud, do you know what paintball is? And it went to the word no. So I gave a brief explanation of paintball. And uh, it responded by, and I don't remember its exact words now, but it responded in a, in a uh, appreciative way. It said, like, cool or good or something like that, you know. It, it would actually interact with us by seeing what was going on around us. And then, and at that time, neither Wade nor Ricky are touching the Ouija board, or, or it, it's only the other girl and myself that are touching the Ouija board at that time. It's not them. But it's interacting with speaking to them. Yeah. As we were working the Ouija board, <clears throat> as if it, as if it's there. We were part of the group. Then, right? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, I so get, I get, I get. It, I, it continued to draw us in by being. So you realize that participating in our life right then. Yeah, it wasn't just because a person's touching it. I mean, the entity is there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, uh, right? Wow, interesting. I, it, it, well, the, one of the reasons that's interesting is because the thought that you had that if they weren't touching it, somehow the thing wouldn't know they're there uh, uh, or be, it, you know, what I mean, that it's kind of an interesting thought. Uh, I, I, I guess uh, it's almost like if they aren't interacting, the, the, the thing wouldn't know. Or, you, know, or you, you can see what they mean by saying how neat it was. I, 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 Ouija boards just don't do this, and, you know, and, and everything I'd ever heard. Another right. incident that did happen that that was even even more interesting. Um, there was another gentleman that didn't didn't believe that it was actually working. He believed that. He believed that I was pushing the plane shed around the board. He believed that it wasn't actually happening. Um, and so we talked him into, <laughs> we talked him into actually working the board with us one night and, and actually touching the plane shed with us. And it, it always worked with me working, with me touching, with me working it. I don't know if anybody else works it without me. Um, so he was working the board with us. He, we talked him into it. He never would. So we talked him into it this one night. And as he's working the board, he's making smart comments because he's still not believing it. He's making smart comments, making smart comments. And Wade told him, you better stop doing that. You need to stop doing that. Don't be smart to it. And then Hugh told him something. I can't remember what he told him. I don't remember either. It was not good, you know. But the the Ouija board told him to to stop being a smart ass, basically, and or something was going to happen. 
And he said, yeah, right, nothing's going to happen. And at that moment, a black light on the stage, above the stage, above the stage blew out Big and slide. shattered. Glass went everywhere. All over the stage. Wow. And, and to my knowledge, we, we've never had a black light. And, you know, it's a, it's a fluorescent tube. We've never had one just shatter. We, we've had our girls kick them before and things when they're on the up high on the pole. But not one has never shattered, but it did that night. Yeah. Right. And so he, he, he never touched the Ouija board again. <laughs> after that, that was the first night he'd ever done it, but he believed it a little bit more after that. Right. So, so in, in, in some ways, this, this thing, uh, at that point got aggressive. It got offended and it got aggressive somewhat. I would say so. Yeah. And, you know, before I forget it, Brent, there's another little point I want to bring up. Uh, you were talking about the familiars earlier and yeah. angels and things. I don't know if this is pertinent to the story or not, but, at, you know, at the beginning we told you that there were two main spirits that we were talking to that we thought we were friends. I thought were our, our friends. One of them, uh, her name was given to us as Eliza, and she claimed to be an angel. Which uh, is again, that's that was unusual, and and what I know about the Ouija boards, but I don't know if that has a pertinent role to play in this story or not. But for the entire time that she was there, uh, she claimed to be an angel, which I always thought was pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah. Well, she might have been a fallen angel, you know. I mean, well, that could be yes. Yeah, I mean, you know, you, you're either going to have a demonic spirit or some type of fallen angel. Um, you know, uh, uh, so that's not surprising at all, really. <laughs> well, to, toward the toward the end, before my memory, before before the part that I don't remember so much anymore, I do remember that at some point. She was trying to protect me. That's true. Yeah. She was trying to protect me from the festo because it, I, re, I remember I remember everything up to a point, and then I don't remember anything after that. But I remember that she was trying to protect me from the festo, and I remember that she said that she died doing it. We we need to add that we found out later uh, it gave us the name. The name it gave us of of the bad thing was uh, I pronounce it Mephisto, and uh, it's uh, that's what we learned the name was of this bad thing that might have been controlling yeah, yeah. the whole time. Um, for example, one time he would uh, we'd be talking to the two spirits, you and Eliza. And everything was going great, having a good old time, you know, talking about this and that. And it would literally spell out the word S-S-S-H and say, be quiet. He said, why? And it would say, big bad is coming. Big bad is coming? Yes. And it, it would just literally quit working. And, and it, it wouldn't work anymore. And we'd sit there, and maybe 15 minutes later, uh, it would uh, start working again. And, and I would I would say, like, well, what was that? What was going on? And it said, big bad, big bad. It just kept repeating it. And then it would say, it said, uh, big bad green worm. And uh, literally, that, that's what it spelled out. And I said, so big bad is a green worm? And it said yes. So, uh, you know, whatever we did that the rest of the evening, it wasn't really important with it, but we, we kind of wrapped things up and we headed home for the night. And uh, when we get to the house, the garage door opener would not open the garage door. So we had to go into the, the front door of the house, which never really happened uh, very often. So we walk around the sidewalk, we get to the front door, unlock it, and go into the front door. And uh, the, the very first thing, when you click the light on, uh, before the carpet starts, there's a little area of uh, linoleum there. The foyer. And um, 
we saw laying on the floor, right at our feet, a big, fat, green worm that was maybe three inches long. And uh, it was big around, I'm a big guy, you know, and it, it was nearly big around as my finger. And uh, a good, like I say, a good three inches long, bright green in color, almost fluorescent. Now, I, I'm sure that this worm existed. It, it wasn't a catalpa worm. I've seen those when I went fishing. But uh, the, the point is, is after the reach experience of saying Big Bad was a big green worm, then my garage door opener won't work, and there's the worm in the foyer when we walk in. you never seen a worm like that yeah, before. You know, yeah. been in that house all those years and never seen a green worm. So I always felt like that that was foretelling of, of something on the Ouija board, and boom, there it was. That was the beginning of the bat. Yeah, that, that, okay. she's right. That's kind of when the bad stuff started raising its head. But okay. we continued to work it because at that point, you know, you know, we were the, 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 the you know, um, it, that kind of makes me think about when uh, when Jesus said you can cast an unclean spirit out of someone and it'll wander through dry places, and then it'll come back and see that you have uh, uh, swept your house clean. He's talking about a person, you know. But basically, he said you can cast a unclean spirit out of a person, and it will go away, and it'll come back and see that you try to put your life together kind of thing. And it says that it'll go and gather up seven worse than itself. So there's in in in, uh, in in that he was saying that there's different degrees of how bad some of these entities are. None of them are good. They're they're all bad, but there's some that are really bad. And you know, even Jesus said that there's some that can come out only by uh, prayer and fasting. You can't just cast them out because the disciples were confused because they could cast spirits out, but every once in a while they ran into one that they couldn't cast out. And, um, and the Lord said that that kind can only come out by prayer and fasting. So it, you know, they're, these spirits are lying spirits for one. They're deceiving spirits and they're seducing spirits. So you never really know what to believe, but it's possible that there was one that was outranking them that was coming through, you know, <laughs> somehow or something. I mean, I don't know for sure, but, but uh, that, that's uh, it, that's uh, an interesting thing that that it would say like shush you know here comes uh, uh, one that outranks us or one that's really really bad and, um, it, but, well, but let, yeah let's let's go let's go through um, kind of uh, uh, to when things started you started noticing it these things turning um, as as manifesto as as he started coming, he started challenging Wade, actually. Um, he would say things on the board, you know. And he would call him Yaya. He, he would say, you know, uh, shh, Yaya's here. Um, at, at times, um, when Yaya wasn't here, for example, um, one night, um, Hugh and Eliza were both actually talking to us, and um, they suddenly had to disappear and couldn't talk anymore. And then it was just Yaya on the board, and that's when he was challenging Wade. Okay. And, um, and he... He would say things like, you know, I'm going to take her from you. You can't keep her. She's mine. And, uh, of course, being the big macho guy I thought I was at the time, I was like, no, you're not. You can't take her. You can't do this. You can't do that. Uh, I didn't threaten him, but I wasn't going to be pushed around by it in my mind, you know. Yeah. So uh, I um, kind of stood up against it. And, and, you know, this, again, this things are kind of starting to turn just a little bit. Not quite as fun, and we're kind of questioning just exactly what we're getting ourselves into. And, you know, kind of as well, Sheila's, Sheila's memory gets vague, and I think that's because uh, she was 
I'm going to, for lack of a better word of phrase, taken over. She was partially taken over or, or drawn into it so much that she was only vaguely aware of what her normal duties at the club were, you know. Yeah. Uh, there's... So, at, at this... I'm sorry, I mean to interrupt. At this ahead. point... Hmm, at this point, we working the Ouija board... After after Mephisto started showing up, I can remember that every time that we would work at work, the Ouija board, the colors in the room were really, really vivid. Mm -hmm. Like I could, the colors were really vivid, and the the sounds were really not loud, but very. The sounds were very like like vivid. Um, I started having dreams that I could fly. I actually still dream that I fly, but I don't think it's because of that. But um, <laughs> really, too. Um, but the I don't really remember a lot of things that happened. I just remember bits and pieces. Um, I remember working the board. I don't remember a lot of the things that Wade's about to tell you. I really don't, <laughs> but yeah, you were you were clouded. You were clouded. Uh, you know, these this, this there there was a a power that was beginning to uh, cloud you from seeing, cloud you from. Um, it was doing a number. See, it seems to me that this challenge was given. Um, and it's probably tied to to the whole thing. The, the uh. I have two different stories on this channel where someone challenged one of these entities. Both cases turned out really bad. One of the cases turned out in uh, people, someone dying, uh, but both cases turned out to where these people's lives were ruined and ended up in prison. Um, uh, it, yeah, the, it's, uh, and it was over a challenge, something innocent like, oh, I wished you would try to do this or that, you know, that opened the door and it, and it did. Um, and, the, you know, the, one of the cases, the entity completely took this guy over and he ended up killing uh, his cousin and, um, and his eyes were solid black. Um, he takes off running down the road and, you know, the police end up catching up to him and He's in prison. He doesn't remember doing it or anything. Um, but it, it started with a challenge. That, that was one thing that was in common with both of them, that they challenged the entity. Uh, it, so it seemed like to me the thing might have been trying to provoke Wade into making that challenge. Oh, I'd wish you'd try to do that. Oh, you know what I'm saying? And uh, there's All some right. type of permission that it needed. And um, Well, it... it, it do you do you feel like maybe because they were after me because that's that's what they kept saying I remember them saying they wanted me here's why they needed his permission okay he was your husband and as your husband he is the covering over the wife the head of every man is the Bible says the head of every man is is the Lord and the head of every woman is the wife and then it talks about this covering that you have that is your husband. You're covered by the Lord too, but he he has authority, and he is a covering over your life that this thing cannot go break. Uh, he he didn't have the right, or he would have to get some kind of a loophole through what your husband to be able to take you. You see what I'm saying? Okay. There's a spiritual authority. These things can't go past the line of what they're allowed to get permission to do. And they trick people into giving them the permission. You messing with the Ouija board let the entities in. But but to go as far as this thing was wanting to go, it needed to somehow break this covenant through some type of provocation that it's going to have with your husband to be able to, to do something to the, something that was that is his. You all are one flesh, so to speak. So um, it would have to somehow, to get that door opened, he would somehow have to have the uh, door open through the husband to do it. Kind of like 
I don't know that this is related, but it, is that a similar thing? Like supposedly when there are certain uh, entities uh, or whatever that they can't enter your home unless you invite them in. Right. Yes. Correct. Yes. Right. Exactly. Okay. You know, like how the black eyed kid, kid phenomenon would show up sometimes, and they would always ask if they can come in. And sure. People would be like, no. And they'll try every trick in the book. Yeah, they was just flying out asking, you know. So somehow or another, he was trying to trick you into getting that permission to go that extra step to. Um, well, he never but, got that permission because I stand up against him. But that you know. first night that I didn't know where we were. Well, there's a there's a couple three stories that uh, that happened during all of this after things started turning bad that you and I discussed in previous phone calls. I'll, I'll go ahead and kind of tie them together okay. and, and and get towards where, to the end where things got really strange. Um, I feel like they're important to the story uh, as weird as they are hmm. uh, because, you know, things... I've never seen a Ouija board work like this and it just did things that were incredible as far as its accuracy. Yeah. For example, one night in the office... Uh, I, I, the, the two girls were working the Ouija board. We're in the office at the desk. And the Ouija board is, uh, things would turn, you know, hey, we're in a gentleman's club, you know, uh, you're, you're around uh, a, di a different type of atmosphere. So things would turn sexual sometimes, uh, just like you and I discussed. So the Ouija board is actually telling the two girls what to do. Um, and it, it was sexual in nature, and it would say, you know, uh, I want the two girls to kiss. Well, you know, I'm, I'm sitting there, and, and being being the man of the house or whatever, I'm, I'm going for it, you know. Yeah, I'll go ahead. So, uh, let's do that. It, it would go a little bit a little bit further, you know. It would ask to, to see different things or whatever, and, and they did. Uh... I guess simply for the fun of it, you know, and, and the spirit being involved, uh, as weird as it was, kind of added to it. Yeah. Well, the girl that was with us said that she needed to go to the bathroom, and she said, I'll be right back. So she gets up, leaves the office, goes down the hallway out to the floor of the club to the, to the restaurant. And maybe after a minute, minute and a half, we hear her scream. And she comes running back into the office. And we said, well, what's wrong? What happened? And she said, the, the picture uh, behind me, it, it fell off the wall and hit the back of the toilet. And, you know, I kept pictures behind each each uh, commode there. And, uh, wow, you know, that's, that's kind of weird. And we, we just immediately started working the board, and it, it, it spelled out, you know, basically... In so many words, sorry, I didn't mean to scare you. And we kind of started laughing, you know, that wasn't you. And it's, yes, yes, it was me. It said, uh, I was in the water, is exactly what it spelled out. I was in the water. And well, how do we know it's you? And it's it spelled out, I saw the string. And uh, at that point, she put both hands over her mouth. She and I did not know, but, you know, the girl was on her period, and it said, I saw the string. So it's saying it saw the tampon string. Yeah. Uh, you know, that that just literally freaked us out that that had happened. Yeah, that makes you not want to use the bathroom. My goodness. That's <laughs> yeah. the base, base yeah, in the privacy really bad there. Book, you know? <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that, that was pretty crazy. Yeah. And then um, one other story, uh, you know. Again, you and I have discussed this. It, it's it's a little strange to tell, but it's part of it. And after you explained to me what you thought had happened, uh, I've, I've never been able to understand it until you explained it that way. And basically, Sheila and I had left the club, and again, this is getting towards the the end of things. And we're driving home, and she's in the truck cab. And she sits upright in the truck and starts looking all around out the side window. She turns around, looks out the back window. And I go, what are you doing? And she just goes, I've never been here before. 
I said, what? She said, I've never been here before. Well, as weird as that was, it wasn't really clicking to me, uh, the events that were, you know, about to happen. So we go ahead. It's about a, it's about a 15-minute drive home. It's not real long. And we get to the house. And this is the part where you're probably going to become embarrassed here. And, uh, but anyways, uh, she starts as, as, as we get near the driveway, she starts taking off her clothes and, um, basically when we hit the driveway, she's, uh, she's sitting here shaking her head because she knows where I'm going with this. She doesn't have a lot of memory of what happened here. I it's, don't have any memory you know, of that. <laughs> I she, heard the story, but. but she started, she started masturbating in the truck. Now, as fun as she was as a wife, that really wasn't she, something that she would do in a vehicle on the way home, you know. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I'm a guy. I'm going, okay, this is going to be cool. And it still hasn't really clicked to me yet. So, I go, and she doesn't get out of the mm-hmm. truck. I have to go around and open the passenger door and kind of pull her out. Mm-hmm. And uh, I guide her through the garage. And uh, when we go into the house, she turns to go into the living room. And I said, no, no, no. I said, the bedroom's back here. It's on the right. And she looked at me again and said, I didn't know that. And I, I, I thought that was really strange after all the previous stuff. So we get back to the bedroom, and things happen very quickly. Um, we start fooling around, for lack of a better word, and uh, we're going at it, and... It's just, it's crazy. It's getting wild. And she begins basically to claw me. Now, mind you, this is over a period of 30 minutes. She begins to claw me up and down my back and my chest. I, I, I had marks on my chest for three days. And uh, she was just muttering things like, I don't remember the things she was saying, and I don't even think I could make them out at that time. Well, towards the end of this incident, um, laying there, it kind of got quiet for a second, and, and she said, turn over. I said, what? And she said, turn over. Now, now, mind you, it was her voice. It wasn't like in the movie The Exorcist or anything. It was her voice, but it was full of attitude. So I turned over, not knowing what's about to happen. And basically what she did, she started trying to have sex with me like she was a male and actually ramming her body into mine. Now, as, as weird as that sounds, that's exactly what happened. And that is not Sheila at all, you know. Right. And uh, when I told you this over the phone at another time, you know, you kind of explained to me about entities will try to satisfy their desires. I think that's what you said. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and and uh, yeah, I knew of another case. Uh, they basically were very scared and asked me to come over, and um, basically they wanted me to cast these things out, you know. Um, but they, this couple was doing this type of thing, and it got it progressed to the point uh, to where the entity was welling up in one of them. Uh, this person would wake up like from dead sleep and like speak in unknown language or automatic writings. But whenever they were having, you know, their, you know, making out things, um, he was basically choking her unconscious and saying, I'm going to kill you and things like that. So uh, at first it was like innocent, you know, they thought, well, that would be kind of fun at first you know but but it progressed and there was this basically entity was trying to fulfill its uh, uh, lust through this other person I kept telling her this too I said look this thing's not kidding when it's saying I'm going to kill you it's going to kill you because it was choking her unconscious and getting some kind of thrill from that and ended up um, you know put her in the hospital a couple times and and I said look you're not getting this uh you know, I, I, you can call me over to pray for you and things like that. But if you keep inviting this back, then, then you know, there's nothing I can do for you. You've got to take this serious. 
This thing is not joking. Right. It's, he's saying that he's going to kill you. It's not the guy saying it. The, the entity that's in him is saying it. The same entity that's waking him up and doing automatic writing or speaking in some unknown language that you've never heard. Um, and and uh, that it basically was, and, and she ended up with something herself and she would go to sleep and uh, she would, it would wake her up saying something through her. Um, so they, they were demonized really bad. And, and uh, so, you know, I had, I had to go over there and, <laughs> and do some praying for him and teaching them. It's like, look, you know, you're, you're opening these doors up yourselves. And, and uh, we had, you know, yeah. kind of cover some of those things. Um, but, but it was no joke. You could see the, the aggression that you were experiencing. And if you, if that had it kept going, it would have escalated to the point to where it's hurting you more and more, uh, to, because they come to steal, kill and destroy. I mean, all these verses okay. we have in the scriptures are not telling us something that's just, yeah, maybe, you know, or <laughs> they, they come, to, the, Jesus said they come only to steal, kill and destroy. So if they're, okay. yeah, if they're playing some long con, it's going to be first to steal peace from you and joy or, you know, things like that. And then it's, it, they come to kill and steal, kill and destroy. And that's exactly what they'll do um, over time. But it, it usually escalates after they've drawn you in. And then it gets to a point to where you don't know what to do or how to escape. And that's when they escalate up to try and destroy and kill. And um, so, right. so anyway, that yeah, that was a very interesting thing. When you told told that to me, I was like, wow, that's uh, um, I've heard this before, <laughs> you know, and, and even beyond that, that uh, you know, exactly what you were experiencing there. But that it was fulfilling its lust through so her. Being, I'm sorry. Being that I don't that being that I don't remember any of these days, <laughs> none of them. Right. Does that mean that 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 entire time, the entity had me that entire time? Um. I I, I think it did. Yeah. I think it was it had worked on you, and it worked partly through flattery, things like that. Um, typically, it, it's something to the point of trying to, you know, be flattering or um, um, try to convince you, you know, there's something special, uh, you know. What I mean, about my aura. Yeah, your aura and things like that. And and believe me, God would say those things about you. Okay. So God would say that you're beautiful and you have an awesome aura, <laughs> you know, you know, not maybe aura, but you, you know what I'm saying? The God, God would say those type of things. So I think those were designed to impress you, you know, with like your friend and things like that, gain your trust um, and then to flatter and, you know, and, and these things are, you know, and, and plus I think the environment um, probably was spiritual being the type of place it was, you know. Um, Agreed. Yeah. It, and be it, aware that, I was going to say, Brett, be aware that throughout all these incidents we're telling you, uh, we were still working at Ouija board every night for months, you know. We never really took a night off from doing it. We were yeah. that drawn into it. Right. You know. Yeah. yeah. So so when did it get to the point to where, okay, you, you say you had that encounter and she she is something is kind of taken over here and you know that that's not her behavior okay all so, right well so. that that kind of it, it stepped up a little bit more uh you know there were there were there were a few other incidents similar to that with with myself her and a, a couple other females to where we would all get into these these situations and it would tell all the girls what to do and and, and during those times Sheila was never herself. It was like she wasn't really there. She was almost robotic, but then she would just take over and start telling everyone else what to do, you know. And then you were talking a while ago about this, uh, another couple you knew, and then the sleeping, when they were sleep things. There was one time where I had had 
uh, again, this is towards the end of this whole affair where I had had a nightmare one night. It seemed like it lasted all night long. And it was so intense that I was physically tired when I woke up the next morning. And it was basically, during my nightmare, I was fighting werewolves. Uh, we were in the forest. They'd be behind trees. They'd jump out. They'd get me. Uh, I'd swing on them, hit them with my fist. It, and, you know, I, I don't recall doing any damage, but I survived throughout the night. Uh, there was one part of the dream where a werewolf actually got me and gripped me on my side, and I, I could feel its claws going going through my side, and the pain was incredible. I've never felt pain in a dream before, but I, I sure did then. And uh, I ended up in some type of big old house, like your typical mansion you'll see on TV, fighting these things, and I remember my alarm going off. And the dream was so long, so vivid, that it totally rattled me. And I laid there for a minute or two before I woke Sheila up. So I finally got my senses together, and I, I kind of shook her like I always did. You know, Sheila, time to get up. we got to go. And uh, we'd set, we had to be at the club at 8 a.m., so we'd set the alarm at 7, you know. Didn't give ourselves much time to get ready. So I told her two or three times, Sheila, we got to go. Well, at that point, she raised up, uh, just like sitting up at the waist. And, she, and, you know, it's really weird. I know for a fact, I remember the details well, she did not use her arms to push herself up, which would be normal. And I'm not saying what she did was superhuman. I'm just saying she didn't do it in a normal fashion. She sat up at the waist, looked at me, and growled a deep guttural growl, which must have lasted a solid 10 to 15 seconds. And uh, uh, at that point, I, I was just in shock. I could not believe what I had just heard, what had happened. And for all these years, I've been trying to put it together. I'm sure it's related to this Ouija board stuff. But uh, to have that dream all night long and then her set up, look at me and growl, that, uh, that that's not coincidence. That's yeah. Well, let me tell you something about dreams. dreams. Uh, you know, um if you look in, in the Bible, I've made a few videos about dreams. Um, Pete, there, there, there was angels that came to people inside dreams and gave them messages, okay? Like you have Joseph okay. that went to, there was an angel that came to Joseph um, and said, you know, don't reject Mary, this, this child is of the Lord. So this was a real angel that came inside of a dream and gave Joseph a message. Okay, you have the wise men, the Bible, you know, people call them the wise men. They were probably magi. They were probably from the Babylonian captivity left over who were actually uh, Hebrews who, you know what I'm saying? But but anyway, right. there's angels came to these men and warned them in a dream to not go back and tell Herod that they had seen the child who had been born. Okay, so the, here's here's real entities going inside someone's dream and and show up and and uh, and tell them a real message, and uh, there's other stories just just like that. So I'm telling you that you can have real entities since these are um, spiritual in nature. They can manifest physically into this realm. Some of them can. Um, but I'm saying that they can come into a dream also, and you can encounter a real being inside a dream. And I have done this before and noticed in a, in a dream that this thing that was standing there was out of place, and it noticed that I noticed it, and it basically took off, and I woke up. This thing was it came into my dream and was, wow. messing, you know, it, uh, so... There's there's a, a non physical aspect that I think is in in the spirit realm type thing that where our consciousness or something I don't know exactly how it works but I know that for a fact in the scriptures that angels could go to people inside a dream so these other type of entities could also do the same type type thing so you may have been in a spiritual battle with real entities and that entity one of them was right there beside you because it had already taken over. And, and her, and, and, and she's, I, I think she's partly, you know, 
innocent in this thing, not knowing that the, these things were going to go that bad. And I believe God had mercy and, and helped bring you all out of it. So it's not, right. I'm not being negative or judgmental uh, to you. Lots of people have done lots of things wrong. I mean, I've done things wrong in my life and invited things and what have you. Everyone has. So it's great God, to do on this. God has been bringing me, God has been bringing me out of things and protecting me my entire life. Amen. Yeah. And even when we don't deserve it, you know, the all of the apostles said, we love God because he first loved us. They didn't even know to love him. You know, we don't, we don't, even, we don't have the ability to do it until he shows us how much he loves us. And then that's what causes us to love him. As, as we don't really have it in us until he gives it to us. And, and we, we you know, yeah, God's been very merciful. I mean, it's, it's surprising, you, you know, you all both didn't die um, messing with that stuff that much, <laughs> <laughs> you know. My goodness. Well, you know, and again, these these, these stories, are they're, they all occurred over this, this three-month period, and, and some of them kind of been at random that I've related to you. But, you know, we're kind of getting towards the end of the things that were going on. And the other thing that I'd like to, to bring up or point out, I should say, I guess, is that there were several times, uh, for example, one time in particular, we've got 150 customers mm -hmm. in the building. My four or five waitresses can't handle them. So Sheila's job was to go out and waitress herself uh, because she's top notch, knew what to do, and needed to be out there because we had customers going without. So she goes out to waitress. And believe me, she is very dedicated to her job and just an, an incredible employee, if that's what's called upon for her to do. Uh, so, and loyal. So anyways, I fully expected her to be on the floor. So I, I'm out there and, and I start looking to try to get a track of where everybody is and I can't find Sheila anywhere. So I start asking my bartenders. Nobody's seen her in a long time. Well, that's not right. That's not that's not cool. I want to tear looking for her. I, I, she's not in my office. She's not in the tanning room. She's she's nowhere to be found. And then finally, it, it hits me. Uh, I try, I go to the storeroom, which is across the hall from the office, and the door's locked. So I pull out my keys, I lock the door, and as soon as I open the door, she's in the storeroom, sitting at a table, working the Ouija board by herself. Um, and it's, it's moving around with her hand. She, she's only got one hand on it and it's, it's going all around. What are you what doing? And she looks up and she, and she looks back and just starts working the board again. Doesn't answer. Uh, finally I go over and just take it out of her hand, um, and get her to go back to the floor, but she was, not what she needed to be to, to be out there to wake her. So it's completely uh, gone, you know. Uh, and, and over the next few days, I tried to watch her closely, but she would literally intentionally give me the slip, uh, scoot away from me, when, I mean, just sneak around behind my back to get to work the Ouija board by herself. And, and what was going on between her and the board, I don't know. I don't know what was said, questions, anything. I have no idea. But she she hid it from me, and I would, of course, find her. Uh, the times that I did find her, she might have done it, and I never knew it. And well, again, this is towards the end. One thing I do remember, and I, this is one of my last memories of, of it, I remember being very, very concerned about Hugh and Eliza, because Eliza, one of the entities we talked about, she she died in this episode. She something happened to her. She was trying to protect me from Mephesto, and he snuffed out her light. He killed her. She's gone. So I was very concerned about Hugh and her. And I remember being so concerned about them. Yeah, well. And that, wanting that, to protect. I remember that. So, so you're and concerned that, yeah. for, these, for these two spirits, but you're totally forgetting about this million-dollar business we're running. 
you know, you just blew it all off. So it's <laughs> not good. <laughs> yeah. That well, was not there. That was my last answer. I, I haven't heard this part of the story till now, Brenton, so I'm just oh, discovering this. I, well, that's, listen, that's, though, I think... Bringing back memories. Listen, I, I think that was by design, though. I, I really don't think that there was an entity that died. I think that was by design. It was a trickery. Right. That for, because knowing that you would be concerned. See, that's a good guy, bad guy technique of um, negotiating. There, there's, there's similar tactics that can be used in negotiating is um, to have a good guy, have a bad guy. Um, because you, you can shift people's concerns and, and, and you know what I'm saying? I, I, I don't okay. I don't think that there was really an angel that was there to protect you that would if there was a good angel there, believe me, they excel in strength and they do God's bidding and they do not lose. You see what I'm saying? Yes, sir. So so I I just think that was a trick. Um because knowing that would draw you in and that's probably what you were exploring thinking this this thing's in trouble i need to go and you know and ask some questions and things like that but it was a trick to draw you away because you remember the goal was to take you from him wade here um partly you know what I'm saying? fitness against each other yeah yeah right yeah and and it sounds like to me that it was just another tactic a trick but, you know i think people don't realize that these Entities are thousands of years old. They're very, very intelligent. <laughs> and they're, you know, you're not going to outsmart them. That's why we stick to God's word. You know, we there's there's the only hope we got is to be covered uh, by the Lord and to, you know, stick to the word of God. Because if you're going to match wits, you're you're just going to lose. Because you know these entities are you know six to 10,000 or whatever, however many years old, you know, that you could imagine trying to match wits with some, something that was, you know, been around ever since the beginning. Right. Uh, you know what I'm saying? You're just not going to outsmart her. I believe that. I, was I, and I, you know, I kind of pride myself. I've always been the typical tough macho guy, you know, that's why I like to think of myself, uh, six foot four, 280 pounds of, uh, of muscle that's going to, Kick anything, but and I and I remember, you know, being not scared of this thing and challenging it. You know, it's uh, it's not, uh, but it's it's should not have done. But I just didn't have the education then that I do now. You know, right. and you know, right before, you know, we're we're basically near the end, and it was just within a day or two that I realized that Sheila was completely gone. As to who she was, her body was there. She would hang around me. We'd go home. I remember uh, setting little things near the door so if she went out of the room that I knew it uh, because I had to sleep too. You know, she's looking at me strangely because she didn't know that. Uh, you know, she doesn't have a memory of this, but, you know, I've told her before that we had to watch her. And some of the people involved with us during this whole week experience, they were well aware that she was gone, taken over, whatever you need to say. And they would help me watch her. Right. And we're getting we're getting near the end of the month. And something in, in clubs in Texas that you have to do is, it's uh, TABC, you have to do your taxes at the end of every month. Well, that's not something just anybody can do. you got to know what you're doing, and you got to have the brain for it, and not make a single mistake. I was extremely good at it. And that was her job, you know, that's what she did. Well, mm. and I kept talking to her, Sheila, you've got to do TABC because you have to have it postmarked by a certain date. And she she might pick it up. And I'd come back 30 minutes later, not a darn thing was done on it. And this went on for an entire day. And I, and I know she's having problems, and it's not really her. What do I do with it? And uh, finally, she just do it down said I don't know what I'm doing I don't know how to do this and and there was a lot of other statements as well that were weird but passage of time over the years you know that they escaped me now but uh it just wasn't her again her body was there and my friends and I did what we could to keep an eye on her we'd lock her in the office uh and I was beginning to 
kind of lose my sanity. I, I didn't know where to go, what to turn, where to turn. And uh, as like I told you before, eventually, I, I just, for lack of a better thing to do, I ended up, uh, I just looked out the old phone book at the time, since there was no internet Google, and called the Catholic Church there in our, our hometown and asked for guidance there. And uh, they, they took they took care of me and, and handled it. Uh, you know, we can we can go over what they did if you'd like. But uh, well, I mean, uh, if you well, that, we wouldn't have come out of it. Right now, we are uh, um, coming up on an hour and a half, and this is uh, so I kind of want to wrap this up. And um, depending on like the questions and stuff, we might have you come back and we we'll, we'll, can discuss some more more on you know of this whole thing. But if you would just kind of give a um, a brief idea of what uh, what happened to get her freed of this kind of thing to where she was okay. back and able to do her job and things like that. All right. Well, you know, I called the church, which is kind of weird, a, a gentleman's club, you know, we, they, they obviously, they knew who we were, it, it, it's a big town, but they still knew who we were, and I explained my situation, and they, and they basically said, I'll have somebody call you back, and I said, do you promise, they said, yes, we promise, so the person called back, I explained it to him, and he said, I can help you, and uh, would they admit to this now, you know, probably not, but it is what they did. So he came out, I met with him, and I talked to him, and I showed him, he said, show me all the Ouija boards that you were using. And I kept them, as weird as it sounds, underneath main stage. Uh, that's where I kept them at, so we could get to them easy after we closed. And we had a couple store-bought Ouija boards, then we had uh, some Ouija boards that I had made uh, from poster board and highlighter because they glowed in the dark with the black lights. So he instructed me to take all the boards, tear them up, break them up into different pieces, and go out behind the club, away from the club, if we're kind of out in the country there, and bury each piece individually, about a foot down. Does that have any uh, meaning, a foot down? I don't know. I didn't ask. He didn't say. But I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I, I, dug a, I dug a lot of holes, you know. And, and got that taken care of. He walked around the club. He, he said his uh, prayers or, or, or whatever he needed, incantations. You know, I, I don't really know what to call what he said. But uh, he, he walked around the club. Uh, I guess he blessed it. Um, and then he told me what to say. Uh, just I have, it, I have it all written down. And we did that. Everything he, he said to do, we did. I did. And uh, I don't remember him saying anything to me right. at all. Again, Sheila's memory is just not there on any of this. Right. And, and I can tell you that within within hours, you know, I guess overnight's the best way to put it. When, we woke, when she woke up the next morning, she was pretty much her old self and did what she needed to do to, to run the club with me. Uh, I detected really no, nothing wrong with her. She, she, was, uh, she was weak. Uh, she didn't feel well, but mentally, uh, she was all there. And uh, all right. whatever we did must have done the trick because uh, I've never seen, seen any signs of anything since. I was very tired. Yeah, I bet. Very, very, very yeah. tired. That that kind of stuff can really sap you um, physically. Um, the spirit, the spiritual activity like that can actually physically drain you. Um, so I, I would I would expect that you had been tired. Now now when when he asked you to say stuff was part of what you you said denouncing the using of the Ouija board. Do you remember? As I recall, it, it was, uh, he, he had it all written down for me, and I recited it as out loud as I read. It was, it was a prayer. I can't remember what the prayer was. Uh, I don't uh, specifically remember too much about uh, mentioning the Ouija board. Uh, uh -huh. I spoke with him. I spoke with him about that to him. 
he, you know, he asked me, are you ever going to use this again? I said, no, you know, uh, I said, this is bull crap. Never going to touch again, blah, blah, blah. You know, but that was just personal between him and I, what yeah. he had me read aloud, uh, did not say we should board a particular. No. Okay. Well, I mean, if you were praying, I get, you know, it, well, during this whole time, did you pray any, like asking the Lord for help and things or? Yes. Yes, okay. uh, I can, you know, that's an interesting point that I forgot to bring up. I can remember many, many nights of, God, what is going on here? Please help me. You know, all my life, I mean, I'm going to sit here and say, I do believe in the Lord, and, and I, I talk to him constantly. I have all my life. And, you know, I know that may be a contradiction to me being involved in, in other activities or doing these things or Ouija boards, whatever, but... Uh, just because I did all that stuff doesn't mean I don't believe in God. Well, I, I talk to him all the time. We didn't yeah. start out the Ouija board as anything but fun. Right. Right. Well, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. No. Those, those I, lots you know, of questions. Tell me what to do. I, I need help. I need, I need, I need Sheila back, yeah. you know. Right. Well, well, countless times. To yeah. answer your question. Well, m m you know, many Christians will go get themselves into a, a bad place doing all kinds of different things. And, and the you know they they call on the Lord for help and He helps them right out you know He doesn't He don't, doesn't want you in that situation He said that He would leave the ninety nine sheep and go find that one who had strayed off you'd strayed off you all strayed off and got yourself in trouble if you was asking the Lord for help I'm sure that He lined up the help He came to help and and that's how you got out of it or it would have stole killed and destroyed it was going to destroy your business too if you hadn't got your stuff done. It, it was set out sure. to steal, kill, and destroy. Period. That's, Jesus said they come only to steal, kill, and destroy. So, believe me, that's a fact. So, the fact okay. that you didn't die and, and you weren't destroyed is proof that the Lord came to help. Because those entities won't stop if if they aren't made to. And So, it sounds like to me that, um, that uh, you know, it sounds like to me that the Lord did help. If you were asking him for help, I just believe he... I, that's my opinion. I think he came to help, or you'd be dead, he, both of you. He, he lined me up in the right way to call and get the right things done. You know, right. I agree. Yeah. Hey, Nancy. He came in the form of the priest and helped. He was there. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't be. Yeah, believe me, in, in the Bible Belt here, it it would be hard to get any religious person from a church to come to a topless club. You know, for for whatever. So something about my story prompted him to come help, and I've always been so thankful for that. All right. Well, I think there's a lot of uh, churches that really wouldn't know. I mean, there, there's many that do. So I'm not, so I'm not saying there isn't because I've I've known Baptist preachers that get called to places, and they said they walked in and there was dishes and stuff flying through the air, hovering and smashing against the wall. And, and uh, you know, got it was really bad, and and they had to right. you know do you know pray and and uh and rebuke things, and, you know the whole nine yards, and uh and uh it, it was you know scary stuff, and so there, uh, but there are some I think that never dealt with those type of things, so they kind of don't don't know exactly what to do necessarily, or maybe even a little bit scared about it. Um, yes, you know what I'm saying. <laughs> so I. You know, I'm just kind of speculating on what might have been happening in your area. So, you know, there might have been other people that would have been willing to help. But not everybody knows what to do, even if they are part of the church. You know, right. uh, it's, it's, it's not something that I comes like, up every day. You know, hey, my wife's, I like, <laughs> my wife's possessed. Can you come cast demons out? <laughs> you know, it's like you know, it's not an everyday <laughs> phone call. <laughs> I guess not. I uh, wish that we had actually had, I wish that we actually had, the ability to to make a movie of this because all all the time that we've been talking has been almost two hours all of the stories from this still yeah. haven't been told there's still yeah there, there's some parts I, there's some story. parts of it that, that Wade told me that, that that haven't been brought up that were pretty bizarre um but for time's sake we're gonna have to have to end it here and yes, I agree. If someone wanted to make a movie, it'd be a heck of a movie, um, for for mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> you know, I could see how it could be done, and it would be kind of scary, and uh, there could be kind of 
um, uh, escalating. It has to be a rated R movie. <laughs> yeah, certainly would have to be rated R for the you know lots of reasons there, but um, interesting. But anyway, thank you, Wade, and thank you, uh, um, Sheila, for for sharing. Uh, um, well, to God that he helped. Yeah, yeah. You're I, welcome, Brandon. Thank you. Well, I, I'm sure that this is going to help convince somebody um, the uh, that, that that can be very dangerous. And some of the things that we've said throughout the, the deal might help disarm some of those trickeries that they use, these entities use, that impress people or flatter yeah. people. Those things are seducing. You know, the scripture calls them seducing spirits, deceiving spirits. You know, the, the, these things are for a reason. Um, but it did seduce you, you know, didn't it? Did, right. With the flatteries even and, and the, the knowing things that was seducing, it drew you in and, and, uh, um, very, it's a, it's a very interesting case. Uh, but I, 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 I would just want to say that, uh, that God bless both of you uh, and, uh, I encourage you to pray daily, every, every night for bed, just say a, a prayer of some kind. Um, make sure you do that daily and thank God for things first. And then if you have needs, ask the Lord for his help and, uh, and, you know, just talk, talk to him like you would your, your dad, you know, your father in heaven, your, you know, and, and, and uh, I do that all throughout the day. Amen. Well, that's, that's yeah, awesome. She's, she's always, she's always saying those things, you know, thanking God and everything. Yeah. Well, that's great, you know, uh, and, and you got a lot to be thankful for, for sure. Um, you are in a very, very dangerous situation there. And uh, thank you, Wade, and God bless both of you all. All right. All right, Brandon. Thank you. God bless you, too. Appreciate all it. Right. Thank you very much. And everybody out there in YouTube land, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, very intense type of story, like I told you it was. Uh um, good reason not to mess with none of the, the Ouija board or any of that type of thing. Uh, it's going to escalate somehow or another. It's going to escalate and get worse before it's over. And uh, if anyone out there has a story you want to share, you can contact me at brentson at gmail.com and I'll get back to you. And uh, other than that, God bless and I'll see you all on the next video. Okay, we're going to look at Deuteronomy 18:10 here. There shall not or there shall not be found among you anyone who maketh his son or his daughter pass through the fire or that useth divination or an observer of times or an enchanter or a witch or a charmer or a consulter with familiar spirits or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. So he's going to drive people that are in the land that Israel is coming into, or the Hebrews are, um, and give them the land because of the practices that are going on in the land. And it says, Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. For these nations which, uh, which thou shalt possess hearken unto observers of times and unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee so to do. Okay, so these nations are doing these things. They're consulting these, uh, um, basically, uh, fortune tellers, these observers of times and diviners. These people that do the divination, they seek um, information through supernatural means, the kind of people who would use tarot cards, or, you know, they're, they're trying to use a supernatural method to seek information or someone who uses a crystal ball or palm reading things like that okay now in this case where they're using this board it certainly would fall under the category of divination because they are uh, using this board to seek information through supernatural means um, now also this is 
uh, falls under uh, witchcraft, uh, it also falls under uh, or a consulter with familiar spirits because they're contacting the spirit realm, which are familiar spirits, and uh, they're seeking uh, to speak with these things. So the first time you use the board and you try to contact uh, the other side, you are automatically doing uh, this right here, consulting with uh, you know spirits from the other side, uh, or a wizard, or th this has to do with seeking wisdom and things like that, a particular type of witch, uh, so to speak. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but uh, typically is a man uh, who does this kind of thing. Or a necromancer. Now, a necromancer is someone who seeks uh, to contact the dead, someone who has died and passed on. So, during this story, at some point, they are believing they are talking to someone who has passed on and uh, and is giving them information. But I'm saying that it was never anyone who is dead because the Bible says that the dead know nothing. Uh, and I don't believe that a person can leave where they're at unless it was maybe possible um, which, with like the Witch of Endor who was, uh, said, was said to have conjured up uh, um, uh, uh, Elijah um, to talk with uh, the king who was about to you know, be out of power, King Saul, who had outlawed this and put uh, most of the witches and stuff to, to death. And she was real reluctant about doing this, but uh, Saul was very desperate to get a word from God, and he had no one uh, because the prophet had passed away. So Sam, or Samuel was the one that uh, she conjured up, I'm sorry. Um, uh, he asked for her to bring Samuel up. And when she was looking in, you know, I guess she was looking into like a bowl with water and oil mix. And she said, uh, you know, I see uh, in the Hebrew, she said, I see an Elohim coming up. Uh, so this was uh, someone who was from that realm uh, the word Elohim is used for not only God, uh, but it is not a name for God. Elohim uh, more ascribes uh, locality than it does uh, character or uh, uh, character traits and things like that. Uh, some people think Elohim is a name for God, but Elohim is used also for Baal, the cloud rider. Uh, and, you know, so uh, some of the terminology used when Jesus says, you'll see me coming on the clouds of heaven, um, th those kind of terms uh, were well known to the people of the time. And uh, Baal was also an Elohim, but he was a false god. And uh, when Elohim was using, used in that case, it was more like I see a spirit coming up. So it was saying, Kind of like we would say, I see a spirit being coming up, something like that. Now, uh, contacting the dead with necromancer, um, di divination, seeking information through a supernatural means, and these are, you know, tip. These are kind of uh, uh, basic uh, definitions I'm giving you, but I'm saying that they're doing these type of things and consulting with these familiar spirits to who actually do know lots of things about your past and things like that because these creatures followed you around just like in Job. Have you considered my servant Job? And uh, the adversary or Satan at that uh, time, which is a title for this being that came in uh, amongst them, uh, Satan meaning adversary, um, he said, yes, you know I have, and he described uh, his view of what he had been observing. And he had observed that God had had a hedge up around Job. He had had his he hedge up around all that Job had. He had a hedge up around Job's family. Um, God had a hedge up around everything about Job. It was a multi-complex layered hedge of protection that was around Job. And when you start dabbling in these type of things, it starts breaking this hedge down and giving uh, permission so to speak, or legal rights to move in to do certain things. But if you notice in this story that 
that um, it, with Job, everything was taken from Job except Job's life and his wife, um, because his wife was under the covering of Job. And in this story, you notice that these spirits kind of uh, uh, tried to torment or um, provoke uh, a a uh, more like a challenge to the husband in the in this case to be able to take the wife. He was looking for permission to break this covenant and break this covering um, of. Uh, the husband and wife so that he could overtake the wife and he tried to implement a challenge. I've got a few videos where people challenged a devil or a demon and uh, it did not go so good. Um, you never want to make challenges. You resist them and they'll flee and you pray and you uh, you know rebuke these things out of your life and, and uh, mainly you stay close to your shepherd who is a good shepherd. He's the one who will protect you and set the hedge. The shepherd protects the flock. The flock does not protect the flock. The shepherd does. All right. And uh, anyway, we notice here that God basically forbids these things. There's lots of people that will think, oh, I, they're an observer of times. They mess around with, uh, you know, the uh, fortune telling type things. Uh, you know, looking at the stars and and uh, plotting, you know, your destinies and and things like that. But these things are forbidden to God, uh, so don't do them. That's that unless you do not believe the Bible. And I've had lots of people say, "Oh, the Bible's been corrupted, been changed." But the the leading scholars who aren't even necessarily Christian, who study all these ancient writings, they know that the uh, the scriptures are exactly the same if you read a King James version of Bible and you uh, can translate that back and forth between the English the Old English and the uh, original languages if you match them up to the Dead Sea Scrolls they're, they're accurate uh, completely accurate and uh, if the the New Testament writings were quoted they were uh, um, already established what books uh, were going to be used in the churches what were considered the Word of God uh, in, in the very early years at the time of the disciples um, there are fragments uh, showing that the, the scriptures are accurate and the only thing that I would say about something being changed or or uh, manipulated some would be when you find like NIV translations that are translated from translations off of another translation and you start to have watered down versions and things such as where the Bible says that Jesus is the chief cornerstone that the builders rejected and sometimes you'll have some versions that will say something like he is the chief capstone and that's new age kind of thinking uh, with the pyramid type uh, uh, symbology and things like that so if you want to have an accurate version of the Bible use the King James Version and a concordance this right here is the blue letter Bible that I'm looking at Google blue letter Bible you can go look at the original words used uh, that were translate literated over into English but anyway this this is the the evidence in the scriptures that what some people do thinking is harmless is not harmless. Mediums, psychics, uh, people who mess with divination or fortune telling and, and uh, any type of witchcraft whether white magic or black magic or whatever they think that it might be it is forbidden. Consulting with spirits being a medium who consults or talks with spirits and they say well these are good spirits I'm talking to you're forbidden to be talking to any spirits if you have a good angel that is protecting you they're out to do God's bidding they excel in strength and do God's bidding if you ever wanted an angel uh, to be protecting you uh, some extra protection or something the, the most you could do would be ask the Lord 
to set up angels around your home to protect it. Ask the Lord to uh, cover your uh, house uh, with the blood of Jesus and uh, set up a hedge and and these kind of things. You repent of your sins. Uh, you ask that you you confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and He was raised from the dead and ask for forgiveness of sin and uh, the Lord will save your soul and He will be doing the protecting. If you get yourself into a situation where there's demonic possession going on, uh, the first thing is to repent. Uh, tell God, you know, ask God to forgive for doing these things and ask God to save your soul and that, and that you believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that G God raised Jesus from the dead and then um, confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and you shall be saved. God keeps his end of the deal. And then if you need further help, that's when you go contact uh, uh, some Christians maybe at the, the uh, local church in your area. I would suggest uh, going to a sound doctrine type of church that studies from the King James. Like uh, I would consider going to a fundamental Baptist church asking if they could help. Uh, I have a pastor friend who is a, uh, a missionary Baptist uh, preacher, been for 40 years, and he's been to uh, several um, uh, homes that had uh, the dishes flying around in the room and uh, and he goes in there and pleads the blood of Jesus and and uh, and you know and he, he breaks those powers of darkness and, and helps to uh, pull these people back to the Lord you know and uh, and uh, and putting their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and uh, and you know and he goes through and and prays and blesses the the place and and what have you and and I've done the same uh, you know I'm uh, doing what I do I have people call me for help and m the main thing I do is point them to Jesus point them to the Word of God show them where things are said in the scriptures what they might have done to open these doors help them to pray and ask God for themselves to forgive of their sins and ask the Lord to come into their life Ask the Lord uh, to help them, basically, and, and uh, can make sure that they confess and they believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and he was raised from the dead. That's important. You've got to believe Jesus is the Son of God and he was rose from the dead, that he died on that cross to, to pay for all sin. He fulfilled all the law. So when you break it, you can go to him and in, in him you are uh, made righteous because you are in right standing with God if you are in Christ. In Christ, we can stand before God righteous. And righteous means right standing with our Father in heaven.